and welcome back. We are here live at AWS ReMars. We are AWS On Air. We're bringing you all the tech content you crave. Mm -hmm. I'm A.M. Gravelli. I'm a solutions architect here at AWS. I'm joined by my wonderful co-host, Jillian. Tell, tell us about yourself, Jillian, please. Yeah, my name is Jillian Ford, and I'm a startup solutions architect. And we have a wonderful guest here from OctoML. Please, <laughs> tell us about OctoML and also yourself. OK, my name is Spencer. I, I work at OctoML. And OctoML is a machine learning startup. We're based out of Seattle, and we're about three years old. OK, very cool, very cool. We've, we've been talking with startups yeah. here at AWS On Air. I mm -hmm. think maybe you had an influence on that, Jillian, coming from the startup SA side. Oh, uh, of course. Yeah. I mean, th like, there's just so many amazing things that are happening in terms of innovating machine learning to make it more accessible to um, people. And obviously, OctoML is doing a huge part in that. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. So what we've uh, decided to uh, launch today is actually, it's a very special day because this is the launch of our new product. Oh, um, you're getting to launch something on AWS On Air? I, I think we launched it at like 6 a.m., but like, let's say we're <laughs> hey, launching we'll it. No, 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 we're launching it right, <laughs> right now. now. You're <laughs> this moment. You're getting it here first, people. First baby, yeah. yes. um, we've launched our new CLI, and our new CLI is different from our old CLI because our new CLI generates Docker images. And we think that generating Docker images directly from model files of, of basically any type of framework um, really provides the, the glue needed to let that machine learning developers and operations developers or operations engineers work together and bring DevOps workflows to the AI landscape. I love it. So yeah, that's that's going to be my first question to you. <laughs> is uh, you know, what problems are facing ML engineers or teams that are now doing ML and maybe don't even have ML engineers yet? And how does OctoML factor into helping solve those problems? Absolutely. So there's some studies that are, are linked to on our website that basically put about 50-50 odds on whether or not a trained model makes it into production right now. Which, if you come from like a software perspective, is you know those are abysmal numbers if you're talking about like how many apps did we write and how many of them actually went out the door, right? That's There's always true. one or two apps that didn't make it, but mo majority of apps figure their way out into making it into. I don't know, Spencer. I've been on a lot of failed <laughs> uh, projects in the past, so maybe I'm skewing us downwards on the app dev side, but yeah, yeah, yeah so I get your sentiment. So if machine learning models are basically a coin flip as to whether or not they're going, some th somewhere things are breaking down, and what we we basically see a gulf where like AI developers, machine learning developers, data scientists, and, and if I'm using the wrong title for you, I apologize. The, the titles are a little screwy right now. <laughs> um, everyone should identify, you know, they should use the title they want, right? Um, and I don't want to tell you what your title is. But all right, so you're, you're working with the data, you're creating models, and then how do you get that all the way out into production, right? It, there's a gulf where things break down. And, and one of the places we've identified it is once the model is saved as a file or pulled down from TensorFlow Hub or wherever it comes from, it's, um, it's challenging for operations to do something with that. They don't know how to hold it. It's weird. It's shaped funny. It has requirements. It's not really a REST service. How do we turn that into something we can deploy? But the thing is, operations folks know exactly what to do with a Docker container that's listening on a port. And so um, I can show you like the CLI real fast. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. let's hop in. Uh, Quick to demo. I like that about you. <laughs> that's great. Let's get into it, right? Uh, so imagine for a second that you were, this was your model, this Magenta uh, arbitrary image stylization model. This comes straight off of TensorFlow Hub. For people who don't know, there's kind of a cool GitHub analog now uh, with weights and biases, Hugging Face, and TensorFlow Hub all having uh, great repositories of models that you can just pull down. So you maybe don't need to start with training if you're trying to do your first like Hello World machine learning application. We just pulled down this Magenta file, and we created this OctoML config file. Uh, the CLI will make that for you if you like. You don't have to worry too hard about these shapes. And then OctoML package is going to create the Docker image, and then OctoML deploy, I mean, you know, demo gods, <laughs> uh, you, you never know. It's going to run the Docker image. And then once we're running the Docker image, you know, we can immediately start inferencing against it. So you can see there's like, it's going to remind me of some stuff, and we can run Docker PS. So once you have that, now as an operations engineer, you're like, oh, I know how to deploy that. Yeah, sure. Yeah, <laughs> I, I yeah. get you a container yeah, somewhere you running. Sh ship a container, yeah. And About 100 different ways to do that, Spencer. Two or 3,000 <laughs> different ways, and 1,000 vendors to help you get there. Um, what I'll do is I'll just, uh, I don't want to get to there yet, but we do have a, a Kubernetes deployment here we can play with uh, maybe in a minute. Okay, right. And then this, I mean, is it agnostic of like the hardware where it's actually going to be run? So that's a great lead into um, sort of the second value add we provide to the AI uh, ecosystem. So AI ecosystem is really large, right? And there's, but we don't work with training, we don't work with data cleaning, we don't work with uh, sort of experiments, they're sometimes called. 
OctoMLAI is focused on the inference layer. And inferencing is a vocabulary word. It means um, the prediction that your model's going to make. Like when it, you see a picture and it's got a little green square around the cat, like that's an inference, right? Um, oftentimes with like a score on it, like 77% cat, something like that. Um, and you know, big, big shops with big applications, they're going to be inferencing all the time. They have huge inference workloads. Um, until very recently, inference was the driving force behind ML compute spend. And the change there is that um, there's kind of new research around really, really, really big models, these trans so-called transformer models. Um, and you might have heard of like GPT-3, GPT-2. Yeah. Um, we just talked about that earlier. And all I right, learned what it, a transformer model was. You it, know? And I learned that it's not starring Mark Wahlberg. Like what? That was something that, <laughs> that I learned. OK, well, uh, back in my day, transformers were, were starring Shia LaBeouf, all right? Oh, uh, <laughs> true, true, true. Or even further back, they were, they were cartoons, right? Like, yeah, true. So um, I'll just show the app. That's like yeah. easy. Um, what we do is we make it easy to inference at scale, right? If you're inferencing at scale, all of a sudden performance becomes a factor. And there's two ways performance shows up. One is in just the latency of the request. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing is like an ETL job, that latency of the request transforms into how long you have to run the servers to perform those in that ETL job. Um, so this is a simple app. It's a neural style transfer app, which is a lot of words to saying. <laughs> We're going to take the pineapple and the fire, and we're going to redo the pineapple in the style of the fire. They become one. Yeah, look at this. Ooh. Oh. I didn't know I needed something like this <laughs> until now. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you want that on your shirt, Julian? Yeah. And this is on the public internet. You know, Feel free to have fun with it. You can upload your own images. There's a webcam button I'm not going to press. Uh, <laughs> but the, the, the technology demo behind OctoML here is these four buttons down here. What we've done is we've taken the model, uh, we've deployed it normally on a C5N AWS instance, and then okay. we've deployed our accelerated version of the model Ooh. on a C5N instance. And what the OctoML platform does, it's a SaaS tool. The CLI is all local, but the SaaS tool that we have accelerates the model by using a compiler. So, so no changes yeah, yeah. to the underlying hardware. Uh, you mentioned the C5 in both cases. In both cases, yeah. yeah. The point of this demo is to demonstrate that like, you can use the same, hard or the same hardware with an accelerated model. You get the same result, but it's you know faster. Yeah. Almost twice as fast. You know, we had 700 milliseconds, and now we're at like 374 milliseconds. Yeah. And just to clarify, so when people go and actually do this demo, um, because you said it's like on the internet right yeah, now. Yeah. So normal means not using Octo ML, yeah. and then accelerated means using Octo yeah, ML. Okay. Yeah. And uh, for anybody who's wondering, like, w what we do is we modify the model like the same way a compiler would do with little optimizations. We're taking advantage of instruction sets. We're getting down deep into the you know reorganizing like I guess matrix math, math that kind of stuff. It doesn't change the behavior of the app, and you don't have to upload your data, your training data, or anything like that because we just operate kind of black box on the model. And what comes out is indistinguishable to the human eye. It's mathematically a slightly different image. Like if we ran SHA-256 sum on this file and on, on the other one, like they would not be the same hash. But um, the, you know, our claim is that the model comes out without any change in bias or you know, predictive power. OK, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, um, you know, I, I've gotten some funny looks in the past, I feel like, and I feel a little vindicated today talking to you, Spencer. <laughs> Uh, about DevOps <laughs> and ML and the intersection thereof, um, you know, I, I've often heard it referred to as ML ops and like, oh no, we're making our own thing over here. But I really do think that these two practices, like machine learning, you know, training, getting it to production, getting inferences, benefits from the DevOps practices that have been around for the past 10 years or so now. Uh, what have you seen at OctoML about bringing in DevOps practices to the ML uh, workflow. Yeah, so I mean, a big part of modern DevOps practices is around using um, deployment platforms. You know, Kubernetes is a big one, you know, um, Lambda, whatever you want to call it. Uh, so once you have a powerful, you know, some kind of deployable platform, then you can use like GitOps. Right. And use that with like intense versioning of your software and then a little bit of tooling, a little pepper on the top, and now you have like a complete system that allows you to describe the state of the system and transform that system for, you know, from state one to state two to state three, state n, with visibility for the entire organization, and everyone knows where they need to change things, right? If, if somebody wants the instances to have more RAM, they can just go into the right YAML file somewhere and change the C5n x large to a C5n, I don't know, 60 x large, I don't, whatever it is. But anyone can do that in the organization. It provides a ton of visibility. So that's like, one of the ways DevOps is, is helping, but how does ML join that? Well, what we've right. done 
is made it really easy, we, we talked about our CLI a little bit ago, to version the models, to deploy, and to package them as uh, executable, mo uh, executable Docker containers, right? So let's we'll go back to this example for a second. Like, yeah, I saw you oh. had that K, and I was assuming it was standing for uh, cube control. Cube cuddle, yeah, yeah. Or cube mm -hmm. cuddle. Cube oh. cuddle, yeah. Which this is what do we, we do on this, this is chat? Be, I'm, not, yeah. I'm not used to this. <laughs> I don't know. Everybody's got their own. I'm a cube cuddle kind of person. Oh, potato, okay. potato, I guess, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so this, you know, this is a tarball. You can't deploy a tarball. A tarball of, of just a weights file it, right. is not deployable. It's not no. a, a daemon, right? <laughs> it's, it's just a file. Um, how do you get that over the hump? What our tool does is it takes that model and any other models that you specify. It packages them into a Docker container with something called the Triton Inference Server, which is a project from NVIDIA. Okay. And what that's going to do is it's sort of like wrapping it in a flask wrapper or something like that, but it's like supercharged. This thing is going to listen on HGP for inferences. It's okay. going to listen on gRPC for mm. inferences. Oh, nice. It's going to support batching. It's going to support caching. Wow. It's going to emit Prometheus metrics. Wow. <laughs> wow. wow. OK. And, and the, the model is baked into the image, so there's no like runtime dependencies. It's start, you're starting to be able to use it like a Docker container, which means like if you want to change the version of the machine learning model that's deployed in your production app, you just go change the container and bounce the pod. Right. The next pod comes up with the new container. Boom, you're running the new version. I love that. I mean, yeah, that makes so much sense. It's still software at the end of the day. It Models is a trained model, yeah. but it's still software, and that software still has to go out and live somewhere. Yeah. But you've made it so much easier, it sounds like, just to wrap it in all the other things that I'm already familiar with, like REST APIs, gRPC, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I know how to call those as an app dev. You do. I know. I, I don't even have to call it a gRPC. <laughs> I just generate the SDK, right? Like, it's it's wonderful. Get those proto buffs going. Let's go. Uh, you know, that's you can awesome. spend 25 minutes yeah. dealing with the dependency chain, and yeah. then the last step will be really easy. Yeah, that's great. That's <laughs> yeah. awesome. Yeah, you were mentioning earlier um, about maybe it being on the for inference deploying on um, EKS or Lambda, maybe at the edge. Is there like a recommended uh, you know place to actually deploy, or maybe depends on the machine learning problem? Right. So I'll talk a little bit about how the app works. Um, so what we we see two users come to us for acceleration, right? Two user personas. Some people have already bought into a piece of hardware. Either they've you know they have an edge use case, and so they bought a bunch of like ARM whatever class hardware, and that's what's going on the, you know, let's say it's like a scooter or something. So that, that's their thing. They're like, we need to make models go fast on this, <laughs> right? Other people, or you know, sometimes people have like bought way too many RIs and they can't sell them. So they're like, hey, can I get really good performance <laughs> out of this non-convertible RI? Um, the other type of person comes to us with the model, and they go through our tool and they check every box of every piece of hardware, and they basically are using it to explore. Like, I'll, I'll boot whatever instance type you tell me, which one gets the best performance. And so they can go in, and, and once, you, once you run an optimization, you get this nice like printout with all the different hardware types and their, their relative uh, speeds and stuff like that. And you can see we have a, a wide support for most common AWS instances, yeah. Graviton, um, you know, the, the accelerated ones like G4DN, that kind of stuff. Um, I love it. Yeah. Great. Um, it sounds like you've thought about this question that I'm about to ask you a lot, so that's why I want to ask it. But, you know, in terms of the broader community, I'll use myself as an example here, right? The broader development community. When I've gone out in the past and tried to learn about ML, you know, I'll, I'll arrive at the typical getting started demos that you see, you know, like, here's a bunch of dots, they form a number, <laughs> like, you know, you train a model to be able to detect what number it is. Yeah, there's some graph of it, like, training itself, you're like, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I don't understand <laughs> any of it. But They're like, once, it, once the, the graph two is like this, that means it's trained, you're like, what? <laughs> they start <laughs> dropping a lot of mathematical theory on me, and I'm like, okay, great. I'm I have an English uh, degree. Cool. Um, the math and me sometimes get along. Um, but yeah, how do I take that? Like that, I got started using that, and then go to something like, you know, I've I've got a use case. For example, I'll just pull one out of the air. I, I haven't deeply thought about this or anything. I, I promise. But like, <laughs> how do I detect if a doll? is a haunted doll, oh, right? Sure. Like, how do I get to that problem solution uh, from, oh yeah, I went to these numbers and I found this was seven, but no, now I actually have like this use case for this business that I want to start. Uh, I'm the, yeah. totally not plugging my own business of selling haunted <laughs> dolls, but I want to detect <laughs> if a doll is haunted or not. How, as an app dev, how do I 
get engaged in that? How do I learn more in ML? How do we bring the broader dev community into ML? Absolutely, and if, if you are coming from the operations background or the app dev background, it's like you want to infuse your app with AI and there's a lot to do, a lot to that, and yeah. there's a lot of tutorials out there and there's a million resources, but it's all, it can be overwhelming. Yo, totally. And one of the things I'll just say for anybody who doesn't know, like there's a, a large unsettled framework war in AI essentially. It's not really like a war, but like Kubernetes, you know, with some exceptions is sort of like the platform that you're gonna use. It's a solid choice, everybody knows how it works, everything works with that. Docker's the same way, like, you know, we're past the time when there were like competing Docker implementations, right? ML is not quite there, like Onyx, PyTorch, TensorFlow, Jax, these are like major frameworks that you kind of have to like buy into if you want to get, you know, work done. Mm -hmm. And if you have two teams, you know, if you follow one tutorial or half of one tutorial in, in PyTorch and half of a tutorial in TensorFlow, you will not have a result. Like you will just waste time, right? And when you scale that up to like bigger operations, bigger ML teams, like, you know, you'll have teams throwing Hucken models at you from PyTorch and, and people Hucken TensorFlow models and people putting them in Onyx runtime for some reason, right? So it, it's a challenge to get over that. What I'll say to people who are just trying to get started, I'll go back to what I said earlier, where there's some GitHub analogs that are appearing. Weights and biases, especially Hugging Face, TensorFlow Hub, are places you can download pre-trained models. There may be a haunted model already trained. Haunted doll model? <laughs> yeah, and you a may be able model? to a, wow. add a couple layers to it to, to, you know, it's haunted or not, right? Oh, so it's starting haunted, and then I'm going to train it to be the haunted Is doll. the model itself trained? Is the model itself haunted is an interesting question. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Interesting. Can I detect a haunted anything haunted house haunted I think that's we want to solve the most generic version of the problem we can right yeah yeah, yeah. okay I love the way well, you think also Jillian yeah. uh, you know I know you're in the startup side uh, Maybe we can talk later. This will be our next business together. Business of selling. I think so. Calls. Yeah, don't take it from us. <laughs> I mean. Oh, you're always, you're supposed to tell everybody your startup idea, and then they give you like feedback. feedback. Like, Nobody's gonna go build this haunted doll. Except us. We're the experts. <laughs> experts, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. So you can no. be in on this too. You can be a founding. Member I want to be well. a. I want to be a technical co-founder. Um, yep. <laughs> so anyway, so. You, what you can do is you can go download pre-trained models from places like Hugging Face, and then okay. there's some steps. The Octomel CLI is one path where you can you can pull that out and add it to your app. And once it's a, in a Docker container, and there's like some kube manifests that go with it, now it's just a microservice, right? Yeah. And then it can roll with the rest of the app as we update microservices across the app, you know? And, and once that's there, now we're just now we're cooking with gas. Yeah, and you you mentioned earlier, and and you know I don't I don't we didn't gloss over this necessarily, but it's already got even observability built into it with Prometheus. Yeah, that's huge. You, were, you mentioned Prometheus. Like, I already have observability data, right? Yeah, I, I, this is uh, some cache wow, Prometheus metrics, but the past, there's a, we have also releasing a repository called, um, called Transparent AI, okay. which is an example application that sort of ties all these pieces together. And it's, it's, it's the same thing you saw with the, the pineapple that was on fire, right? Um, obviously, this is you know not necessarily production level code, but it's the idea that you can see how these different pieces together. And when someone says, hey, I just want to pull a model and get that into a real app, yeah. how do I do that? This is an example of how you can, you can pull that together. And we have example Grafana dashboards in this repository that people can pull in to get that observability. Sounds like OctoML might be the right path forward for this doll <laughs> business. I think so. Say, Angelian. Um, did you have any more questions for Spencer? Gillian? Yeah, you know, I, you were uh, showing us earlier all the different, um, you know, EC2 instance types, and I think maybe if you could just clarify with people, because um, a lot of times people either they know exactly like the hardware that they want, um, yep. like which instance type, or sometimes it's they get a little confused about which to actually choose. So, can you? Um, yeah. So. The, the big two inferencing, big drivers of inferencing, right, are batch jobs yeah. and like online, right? So the batch job is we're gonna, we have a thousand JPEGs in a database and we need to scan them all for cats. Uh, that's the, and you know, so you turn on some instances, you just rip as fast as you can and then you turn the instances off, ideally. Online is like, you know, pretend you're a chat application, you wanna scan every message. So you have to have a bunch of services on that are ready to like inference every time something pops in. So your your workload is like bursty, and unless you're like at crazy scale, it's you're gonna have lulls. Yep. Uh, and so, honestly, I think what we're basically recommending is probably you're gonna find the best performance on a GPU for your batch workload and a CPU instance like the Graviton for your um, online serving workloads. All right, we've got 10 seconds left. I want to plug. Go check out the OctoML CLI. 
Git feedback. There's yep. a, a GitHub repo that you can open issues on. Spencer, thank you for joining us. Hey, Julian. thanks for having me. Yes, thank been great. you so much. We'll be right back with more content from AWS On Air.